Frank. Frank. Frank, come on, man. Can I Be Frank is all about capturing real, authentic, unedited conversation. Yeah. As I can, or we're both recording. Yeah, okay. That's okay, pretty cool. Great. Um, um, I, um, what was I was going to say, I'm reading your book at the moment. Oh. I'm, I'm at 90, I'm at, I'm actually, um, I'm cautious about even saying, I'm at 90%, but you know, the Kindle, the way they give you the percentages. And I'm, uh, I'm at the part, uh, uh, <laughs> your brother has just passed away and I, literally an hour ago I had um I don't know whether it's a thing about getting older but I had tears streaming down um my face for a couple of seconds my father died in the month of December um on the 12th of December whatever it was and it was just with the word whale you use the word w-a-i-l and I just anyway we're not going to go there I think it's too early to start off like that but that's where I am in your, your in your life, just so you know. Your, your father died this December. No, no, not this December. No, in oh. in, in December. So it's December twelfth, oh. okay. two thousand and six. But it's just the words, you know. It, I think loss, for whatever reason, you, you, when you hear about somebody else's loss and you've experienced loss, there's nothing quite. It, it just brings you there. For me, it, 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 I think you have to experience loss to know what loss is. Yes. If you, if you know what I mean. Well, I, I think you do. That's what, uh, you know, we old guys, we know this. Yeah. You know, the young guys, not so much. I don't know how old you are, but uh, you're I'm old just... enough to have one gray in your beard, so that makes you a geezer. <laughs> <laughs> 43. It's, well, it's uh, 40, 43. Yeah. God, you're, 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 like a, you're like an infant. I'm only getting started. <laughs> I'm... T I'm <laughs> Only getting started. Yeah, oh my god. Yeah, my whole, no. It's funny though, on that my when I, I remember talking to my um father in law at the time of my father's passing and he said something like, Oh, it's your first one. And then he said, Oh, I don't mean to be disrespectful or whatever, but he lost loads and in his life and um so just what you were saying there about being a little bit older and that you you recognize you know it or have experienced it it rings a bell well it's all relative you know we're all we're all old compared to somebody and i guess young compared to somebody else but you know yeah. it's uh i mean you know the usual cliches if you're young at heart then you're young <laughs> Yeah, you're, some you're days I, I feel that. Other days I feel like a uh, real, real curmudgeon, you know. And I, I don't know. Um, but anyway, I'm not ready to check out yet. I'm no. having too much fun. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I know I'm getting up in the middle of the night to have to go to the toilet. So that's kind of is that a start with the whole? That's a start. Yep, that's it. That's <laughs> Uh, yep, yep. It only goes downhill from there. Yeah, I'm afraid. Frank. Just, <laughs> thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yes. Mm. So I've been I've been dealing with uh, that and sleep problems for a long time. I have chronic. I just have a hard time getting a good night's sleep. Yeah. You know, it's it's very strange, and so I've been trying to get treatment for that and uh, take various uh, stimulants which don't seem to have any effect 
Yeah. I mean, it's, it's weird, you know, I can drink four cups of coffee and, uh, over the newspaper and be ready for a nap afterwards. So that's, yeah. that's the latest uh, joy of uh, getting old that I've had to deal with. And uh, sleep, yeah. I think I've got some solutions happening. I mean, you think we ought to, you know, we're pharmacologists, you think we ought to be able to come up with the sleeping, a good yeah. solution. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, you didn't. We're not here to talk about my medical problems. Before, I actually take an antihistamine for whatever reason. From time to time, I take an antihistamine, and the antihistamine knocks me out. I don't know what that is. Yeah, it, it does. That's, that's a reliable thing to do. To, uh, and, yeah. Um, what's, uh, what's working for me lately, I stopped drinking coffee. Yeah. It was having no effect. And I started drinking tea made from uh, coca and guayusa, okay. which just uh, seems to set me up pretty good. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's why I'm not slowly falling asleep right now. <laughs> no, actually, it's your, it's your stimulating conversation. But, uh, <laughs> um, what, uh, what's on your mind? <laughs> what do you want to talk about? <laughs> okay, well, um, to be honest with you, uh, I have so much that I'd love to talk to you about, so time is, but I, I really genuinely mean that, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for taking the leap um, sure. and, and just doing it, it's really cool. Um, uh, I suppose uh, I, I have genuinely so much to ask you and I kind of, and, and to talk to you about, and like I just wrote down loads of words, but maybe um, the first thing I'll start with, because I'm in the middle of your book, and maybe we'll go with the book, but in terms of your life, um, the one sense I've got so far is this, the, you, you had the privilege or you've had the privilege or the luck or whatever way it works is to be able to follow your curiosity. I don't know if that, that's the sense I got from reading about, like I have been in your life for the last whatever number of days. So it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to, to do. And it's an interesting yeah. situation to be in when I, I know and have experienced what you, you know, some of the big things in your life that you shared in the book. Um, and um, yeah, so I suppose it's the sense of that idea of following your curiosity, it seems to have led you. That was the sense, it was never, there's never a big discussion about money. And in terms of the psychedelics, there was never, um, in my no. mind, there's, there's never a, a worry about, or it's never, even the making things legal or anything like that was never a big thing from what I'm getting. It was, it's all about, curiosity and the work you know i'd say i'd say curiosity is exactly right that that's what has driven me all my life uh you know and sometimes to my detriment you know because like i like you say i never really worried about money career all yeah. that stuff you know which maybe i should have maybe if i had i'd have a little more money now and my career, I've had a career, but it's it's definitely checkered, <laughs> I would say, you know, in the sense that a guy in my position, you would think, would want to be an academic and a professor and, and, and play that game. Yeah. And I have, but I was never willing to make the sacrifices that you have to make to become a fully tenured, fully employed uh, you know, academic, uh, because, like you say, it was curiosity that drove me. It was not, yeah. it was not playing the game of science. Uh, and a lot of ways, it is a game, the way it's practiced these days, you know. But science, in the real sense, pure science, if there is such a thing, and, and there may only be such a thing in a concept, but it is driven by curiosity. Yeah. You know, and, and I think the best scientists are, that's what motivates them is the desire to understand. And mm. I'm not saying I'm the best scientist, far, far from it. But the same motivations is what led me down this path was really, um, you know, I would say two things, a, 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 a restless curiosity and an interest in science and nature and understanding it and then overlaid on that was sort of this you know with both my brother and myself early on probably this 
probably what some would say was, uh, you know, an unhealthy interest in science fiction <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, and so, you know, that got us interested in not just in the, the you know, the phenomena of the world, which it did, but it also got us interested in looking at the kind of the unexplored nooks and crannies of reality and and it encourages imagination you know which i think is ultimately it's probably a good thing i mean i mean at a certain point imagination can cross over into delusion you know yeah. and certainly in the book that's a good you know in the earlier parts of the book that's a good description of exactly what happened, you know, we went to the Amazon in 71, driven by this curiosity and to find, you know, we thought it was about finding, you know, this this obscure orally active hallucinogen, this thing called ukuhe, that wasn't the real agenda at all. No. You know, we were, we were being driven by something else by the time <laughs> we actually got there. You know, and and when we actually got to this, you know, place La Chirera, and uh, this very sort of vulnerable uh, situation, you know, I mean, I was twenty, my brother was twenty-four. We knew, you know, we knew nothing. I mean, we were at that age that young men get to sometimes where you think you know a lot and actually you don't know shit, yeah. <laughs> you know? And that's where we were. So we went there kind of thinking that, you know, we were in control, we knew what we were doing. Well, we had no idea what we were doing. And as soon as we got to La Chirera and, and and then we, you know, accidentally or serendipitously discovered all these mushrooms there, you know, which we started nibbling yeah. in uh, a very casual way and a recreational way, certainly very casual, not having any idea what we were, you know, had no previous experience with it, didn't know what we were really tangling with and thought, you know, mistakenly, as it turns out, but thought, well, these will be fun to play with while we wait for the real mystery to show up. Well, mm -hmm. they were the real mystery, and it didn't take very long to find that out because, you know, they brought that home in the in a very, you know, in a very forceful way. It made clear that this was the real mystery. This is what we had come for, you know, and this this obscure Toto drug which eventually we did find was kind of a disappointment, you know, when we found it because mm -hmm. we, you know, the mushrooms were, we, we, we had gone down there looking for a, a, a perfect orally active form of DMT. It was a fairly reductionist agenda. We wanted to spend more time in that DMT place. And we thought if it was orally active, we could spend more time there and understand it better, right? And, yeah. But actually, psilocybin is the perfect orally active form of DMT, mm. it turns out. Because psilocybin is converted to psilocin. And psilocin is the one that does the trick at the receptors. And I don't know if you how your chemistry is, but psilocin is one atom difference from DMT. Okay, you know, I've, I've heard that, yeah, I've read that, yeah. So, so there's four hydroxy dimethyltryptamine. So okay. it's got a, a hydroxyl group. Uh, again, if you can visualize the indole ring, this is probably not, you know, but if you can visualize the indole ring, uh, then the hydroxy group is on the top of that ring. Okay. Um, that's the only difference from DMT. Psilocybin is converted by enzymes that are found in every cell on the planet that remove uh, phosphoryl groups off other things, and what's left is your OH, your hydroxy group. The that trivial difference is just enough to make it orally active. Okay. But yeah. I, I was going to say to you that um, what I got... Uh, 
Yeah, now you actually alluded to yourself, but to me, so on one hand, there was this purpose driven that it wouldn't even be questioned that she should go there and that, um, and that she would again follow your uh, curiosity or be these adventurers or explorers. But you were on a mission as well. I mean, it is youthful, amazing, arrogance almost, but you wanted to unlock. And then you put the quote yourself, but I'd already thought it before you put it there. That he, he wanted to unlock the keys to the universe almost, and in what you were doing, I, I think that was just astounding at that age to be that way, and you know to be, well, yeah. be that way in mind. I think. Yeah, well, we were we were odd odd characters, you know. We were we didn't really fit in, um, but we've always been interested in the big picture, you know. Yeah. And I mean, when I was. Uh, 11, 12, 13, you know, I was reading George Gamov, who was a famous astrophysicist at the time. Mm. I wasn't reading his technical books, I was reading his popular books, but he was a cosmologist. Mm. And cosmology is about as, I mean, if you're interested in the big picture, it doesn't get any bigger than that. You know, and it's understanding the universe and its origins and where it's going and all that. Mm. I was fascinated by it. I was a amateur astronomer at the time. I mean, I had one of those four and a quarter inch reflectors from Edmund Scientific, and I used to spend a good many very cold nights in the football field across in the park across from where I live basically freezing my keister off and trying to get the damn thing to, you know, focus on <laughs> something of interest. But, but then I, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I was, I really wanted to be an astrophysicist, but I was lousy at math. Yeah. And, uh, and so that was kind of like, you know, you don't really have the chops for this. So, I decided to go into biology instead. <laughs> and that was probably a good choice at some point because then through that I discovered psychedelics and, you know, the rest is history. Uh, and I suppose I, I kind of just, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about like um, the kind of the mindset or uh, obviously your, your parents were your parents and they were uh, reading all about them and it was, uh, but whatever way they tried to kind of get a handle on you, <laughs> they just couldn't get a handle on you. <laughs> no, I, I, no, it didn't work. I mean, may they rest in peace. Yeah. You know, the mom and dad, they were wonderful. Um, you know, we were very lucky. I mean, we had a very loving household and, uh, you know, but they were a typical 1950s, 1960s couple, and they, you know, they were Catholic, so that didn't help. Yeah. Uh, you know, and not exactly growing up in an environment where funny ideas were welcome. You know, yeah. and, and, and Terence and I, we had lots of funny ideas. And, but yeah, but that's and that's yeah. what I mean, though. That obviously within within both of you. There was none of this, oh, well, I, you know, I want to please mommy and daddy and I, I'm going to go and do this and I want to make them, you know, th that didn't seem to be, that wasn't getting in the way of the adventure. But obviously they weren't that no. overpowering no. on you or dogmatic on you. They, I mean, they weren't, um, whilst there might have been religion, either you were totally and utterly rebellious or they didn't, they didn't force it that much upon you either way. There was there was a little bit of both. I mean, okay. my, you know, uh, there was a little little bit of both. I mean, I mean, when it came to drugs, that was absolutely forbidden. You know, yeah. my father was like a fanatic about this, and so yeah. we got into drugs and psychedelics. You know, but to him, drugs was this huge umbrella i mean there was no you know to him drugs were just all drugs and they're all bad they're all evil and, yeah yeah they're all evil and there's no difference between them of course yeah. alcohol's not a drug because no. that was his 
<laughs> you know, well, tobacco was, was the Irish gene. There was, right? was the Irish gene there, and actually, so that was another thing I was going to ask you. Like, there's normally, and so because I have relations, actually, there's a McKenna in my family somewhere. But um, I, there were in you know Irish Americans and and Irish descendants. There is a big drinking culture in the U.S. Like, drink is a big, oh, yeah. and especially if you're Irish, it's almost more. You know, you got to drink more. It's, that's part of the culture, the, the heritage almost, and it's something to be proud of. But that didn't seem to kind of impact you at all. Well, it didn't really impact me. Um, uh, my dad was a drinker. He wasn't an alcoholic or anything, but yeah. he definitely liked his bourbon, you know, and, uh, and he, he drank. And the whole generation did. This was a yeah. post-war generation when I read about what they did, uh, you know, when they, before they had kids, before we came along and spoiled everything, you know, when they were just <laughs> young, married Stolder people. Life. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know? I say that I mean, all the before, time. I have three, <laughs> yeah, I'm three I mean, kids. They just, they take everything. <laughs> they, they take everything. <laughs> yeah, well, they take your life over, right? Do, but, yeah. uh, but my dad and mother were, uh, you know, living in the Bay Area after the war, before the war and after the war, and they had friends there. And the recreation was you went out and drank, you know, yeah. you went to these bars and usually it was like big band. It was the big band era, you know, Frank Sinatra and Tommy Dorsey and all these people. So you danced and you drank and that's yeah. what you did. And of course, as a teenager growing up, you know, in the 60s, in a small town in Colorado, and really in our rebellious phase, I mean, like we were, you know, we never got into any of that because we utterly rejected all of that, you know, and it was like, you know, this is such a, you're such bourgeois, you know, conformists and so on. So we don't want to, we were not interested in drinking because it was something our parents did. Okay. You know, and then a couple, uh, and a couple of encounters with, uh, you know, with blackberry brandy early on, where I got like totally sick, and mm. uh, you know, insulted a number of girls. I went to this high school dance with my friend who was older, who was much more sophisticated than I was, and you know, so he snockered me up with blackberry brandy and then we walk into this high school dance and I'm completely three sheets to the wind and I have no constraints over my behavior. And, mm. you know, I regret to this day, probably the, the young women that I <laughs> insulted and didn't quite assault, but came close, you know, and then, and then, and then, like a week after that, that was my first time that I really got into an altered state with alcohol, okay. and I didn't like it. You know, in the end, I didn't like it because I I just felt completely out of control. It was not pleasant. And then a week or so, about ten days after that, my brother, who was gone at, away from home at that time, he was living in Berkeley by this time, but he came back for the summer and he brought cannabis with me him and that's what changed my life you know i was it's, like it's, it's very funny when i was when i was reading um and he, uh, when i'm reading your book you have a certain style about certain descriptions and you talk about yeah. certain things but to me reading this the, the first time cannabis is mentioned and you describe the experience of it your words almost change and become more um, now, that's not taken away from your previous writing, but your words do, do become almost a little bit more musical. They sing a little bit, you know, the, the words flow together. There's no, it just seems to, uh, the passion seems to really come out, even just in that description. Is that, is that fair? Was that the, is that the discovery? Yeah, no, I think it's fair. I mean, it was a, it was a discovery for me, you know, in the sense that, um, yeah, I mean, he brought cannabis. He brought a cute Jewish girlfriend with him, which was didn't hurt. Yeah. And we used to live uh, across the street from the city park in this very small town that we lived in. And it, I mean, this was 1960, 
six. Mm. So, and in this small town, I mean, everybody was pretty clueless, you know, about this. So, you know, we just went across the street and spread out a blanket and broke out the pipe and, and smoked up, you know, it was, nobody was paying any attention. Nobody would have known what we were doing in the first place. Mm. So it was very loose. And then, you know, and it was so different than my alcohol experiences. I mean, for one thing, it took me about three times to really feel anything. And there was a certain point where I reached where I said, oh, oh, yes. Okay, this is what it's supposed to be like. Okay. You know, and uh, and then I understood, it, you know, you have to kind of, it's a learning curve, a bit of a learning curve. That's, that's interesting in the sense, um, when I was 24, I maybe it's 24, 23. I, I hadn't really smoked it maybe once or twice, but nothing. Uh, I didn't have an interest at that stage in my life. And but I, I, I sat with somebody and there was uh, we smoked three joints and drank beer. And uh, I had just a horrendous experience. And it kind of I, I, one of those moments where I was just convinced something that wasn't real was real. And it just, it stayed with me for a long time. They, that, and I stayed away from it because of it, interestingly. Yeah. You know, but I, was, I didn't smoke it with somebody who explained to me, you know, you have a little bit or a certain amount. And, you know, it's a learned, it's, there's a bit of a mind training almost with it. Yeah. Getting yeah. used to it, yeah. So you've got into a paranoid place well some of it actually kind of uh, yeah i i was convinced i was the person i was talking to who was after revealing a huge amount of problems to me i was convinced that I, they were a figment of my imagination and i was the one with the problems and i was talking to myself <laughs> so i see yeah <laughs> right, then, right. But, but interestingly i am um, from that i kept I kept then having to, for weeks afterwards, when I was in company of people, I was kind of going, did they, can they see that I'm actually going nuts here? And I had to kind of hold <laughs> myself. And then, it's interesting though, it did lead me to a certain place that kind of thinking of, I kept having this reoccurring thought, um, there's, there's something instead of nothing about life. And I'd never really, really thought about life in any way, shape or form. But I just kept having it, and I'd actually just stop in the street, and I go, "There couldn't be nothing. But why, why is there something? There's something. This is. Why is there this? Why, and it, it wouldn't. Li it, it wasn't comfortable. I was scared of the thought, and uh, it, um, you know, just the idea of life so itself. Are you, are you? You mean you're getting a sense of the? I don't know what you might call it, but like the proximity of the. Of the infinite, yeah. or, and, 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 I, I, and, I, and I couldn't. Is it, is it like you're on the edge of a mystical experience where suddenly it opens up and like an ordinary experience, and then suddenly you're in this very special place? Yeah, where and, everything and with, with all the profound, meaningful. I mean, cannabis doesn't reliably do that, but it'll sometimes do that, I guess. Or, yeah, and now all of those, all of those moments that I've had, they, they had nothing to do with cannabis afterwards. This was months and okay. maybe years kind of later, but I always kind of point in my mind that something happened in that, that almost terrified me, but it wasn't really the paranoia. It was more so kind of awakening to the idea of, oh, fuck. Aliveness, I suppose, and it was kind of a scary, uh, uh, and still sometimes I can go there, that scary sense of pure aliveness. And so mm -hmm. the, the idea of the infinite or oneness, well, we might, we might go there. I kind of had half, not that I have a plan, but it half in my mind that we might go slowly and then maybe we we'll leave the, <laughs> in the conversation, we might slowly leave us into, into the everything. Because mm -hmm. my, my, uh, and only just to share to make it more interesting for you maybe but uh, like my path is I, I didn't look into psychedelics at all I had no interest in them I had I'd been brought up with this gigantic uh, education it was like the, I, I essentially on the 30 minute piece that I did about uh, 
when I interviewed Amanda Fielding, I know you probably got a lot of stuff, but I interviewed Amanda Fielding, but it was all basically this idea of my education, what I grew up with from, I was born in 75. And so all through mm -hmm. the 80s and 90s, the, the drugs and particularly LSD or anything to do with psychedelics, you're guaranteed psychosis. So you stay away from that. Right. And that was, right. and I kind of probably was a good, good ladding. I didn't, I, I was always too afraid. So in college, my friends were on mushrooms. I didn't go near there. I stayed away. And, um, and it is really, uh, but I still felt there was something missing. I'm missing something. So mine, I went and studied loads of Eastern spirituality and I actually did a documentary on this thing, on this um, thing called non-duality. It's Advaita, Advaita Vedanta. This, uh, there's these Eastern, we'd say gurus that are not really gurus or Western gurus. But anyway, I kind of went on all that journey and came to the, still looking for, I remember sitting down one day going, there has to be a bit more magic going on. How come, I, you know, I, I want to know the magic behind the scenes. I want to know what's going on. And then, right. and I just remember writing that down or just saying, I want to find the magic. And I suppose that kind of brought me, not till I was 40, to even just venture into the discovery of finding out more about the whole area. But so, and so the reason I'm saying that is as well is that you were 17 and that adventure, or not 17, 16, even 15, that adventure of looking 15. up to the looking up to the skies we'd say like you mentioned or deciding at a very early age because it seemed to be an ongoing communication between yourself and Terence that you're going to I'm going to make this mission to the jungle we're just doing this and yeah yeah actually it was that way you know I mean we um you know, we got along much better after Terrence left, <laughs> you know. I mean, yeah. he, he left Paonia two years before he graduated from high school hmm. and uh, went to California, you know, and he, he basically drove our parents to distraction. He bugged them so much about going away to high school that finally they just threw up their hands and said, okay, all right, already, whatever. <laughs> yeah. you can you can go and he did and uh you know we were you know like i guess like all siblings we fought a lot when we were younger and when we were together but actually at about the time he left we were discovering things about each other that we you know i mean i was no longer just the pesky little brother yeah. You know, Terrence was beginning to realize, hey, you know, he knows stuff too. He's kind of a cool guy. Yeah. And so we had a much better relationship and it only grew closer after he left, mm. you know, and, and uh, we started corresponding and, uh, you know, talking about these ideas. And in those days, you know, a letter from your brother on the West Coast, you know, who's right in the middle of the ferment of all this cultural change, that was for me a big deal. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, now we don't see, you know, an email. What is the value of an email? It's one of a hundred things I have to work through every day, but the letter, an actual handwritten yeah. letter, it carries an impact. And so when he would write me, I would write it back. And, we established, uh, you know, a good communication that way. And then he introduced him to some of his equally weird friends that he was hanging out with in, in, yeah. uh, in high school, some really amazing people, um, you know, who then like John Parker, if you remember in the early part of the book, I talked about John Parker, mm. who was, utterly mad but also uh, some kind of a genius yeah. and you know and he became a very important mentor in my life you know mm. uh, even though i was i was the little brother he he saw something in me so that when i was a freshman in uh, when i finally got to college when i got to the university um john came out to boulder and stayed oh a couple months you know and mm. we would just uh it was a really rich time it was interesting because he knew so much about 
so many different things, esoteric things, alchemy, black magic, witchcraft, you know, uh, Eastern philosophy, and of course, drugs, drugs, drugs. And, <laughs> and we had, and we would just hang out, you know, and smoke hash and, and talk. Yeah. And uh, he taught me a great deal. And then we had a long, long standing correspondence going too, um, hmm. you know, for many years. But poor John, I mean, he was one of these people he just went that he was so overwhelmed with his ideas and his brilliance, he basically just burned out. Hmm. And, you know, later in life, he began, you know, he got hooked on meth and uh, and mm. just just got burned out so it was very sad really yeah. um, but that's the way but I certainly honor what I learned from him so I, I've been lucky in that way I've, I've had good mentors mm. and uh, you know curiosity um, has been a big a big factor that's what that's what really pushes yeah. it forward is just just basically curiosity and uh yeah. you know and that that's that's what that's what informs science as well you know like i say science it, in the true sense is pushed forward by curiosity yeah but it, and it is that's which is it seemed to me that it just it, say not unlike there's i don't know if you have things like montessori's over in um where you are uh montessori is basically we don't, for kids. We don't have anything like that well we do now of course we do now well, not, for, not, when we to, not when we were in school I yeah was, but yeah. It, it, what basically the principle is you know kids go in and they just there there are there isn't a curriculum and they follow their interests to where mm -hmm. they want to go then go wherever they want that's the principle of it anyway um, and right. that's what it's, it's that kind of childlike wonder, curiosity thing that allows exploration really at its best. That's what it is. That if, if that's not lost, to me anyway, looking on the outside, that curiosity, if it's not lost, then it can just be followed and trusted almost. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I think, and I think that is, that is really the origins of all creativity in a certain way. But, but schools, the conventional schools, do everything they can to discourage that. Oh, man, I mean, yeah. That, that is very threatening to them. They don't, you know, the agenda of the, you know, of the conventional education and to a certain extent religion, and I have to be careful or we're just going to get off on some rant, you know, but... No, I'm happy to the, join you on both those. <laughs> well, these institutions are not really about um, teaching you to think. They're no. about teaching you not to think. They're about discouraging yeah. curiosity and independent thought. And they're basically about, you know, we have the answers, just accept this dogma, dogma or this doctrine or whatever, and you'll be fine, you know, just stop asking all these pesky questions well you see, but and, and psychedelics the, are the antidote to that right I mean. <laughs> and but it is you see in that like it is it, it's if you're in that it becomes increasingly dissatisfying though so i would have lived that i was i was born a catholic um you know during lent we had to go there was mass every day and now it wasn't it wasn't ridiculous, but you, uh, it wasn't ridiculous in terms of Ireland, but it was ridiculous. Mm. You, you would have thought it was absolutely ridiculous. Um, and you had somewhat of a Catholic upbringing. This was next step, and I've seen way other steps. And that combined with the traditional getting a job, getting an education and going to work, I couldn't bear that. I mean, I did that for years upon years. With the, I mean, I remember putting on a tie and dying inside. But, but what I'm saying is that was nothing to do with... Um, uh, really, that was that was just innate in the, my character. Would say that wanting to be free, break free from the all those things right. that fear to trap you. You know, with all those structures, the ideologies that are that are um, that do kill anything that is new. 
they just can't stand the new, you know, even though one of their, yeah. one of their guys, one of, Jesus, one of them says, I make all things new. You know, he was, he probably had a big bag of magic mushrooms out in the desert, but that's a, that's a different, that's a different story. That time, you know, when he con confronted the devil and all that, there's no doubt he had some cactus plant or some, <laughs> I'm sure that's been discussed. Right. No, I think there's very little doubt that he did. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, and and you know, this is this is why psychedelics have always, you know, been marginalized in our society because, like, like Terrence often said, you know, they give you funny ideas, you mm. know, and funny ideas are inherently threatening. Yeah, but, know, they threaten, uh, but they threaten the person, though. It's not like you remain nice and safe, and the ideas are over here. It's well, well they challenge the person. They, they, they burst the person open, yeah. Yeah, they challenge the person, but they also challenge you to think about your relationship and the way you fit into society and so on. And they, yeah. they challenge you to 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 question authority, to question dogma, to question institutions. You know, they make you think things like, well, you know, why should I spend the rest of my life working in a cubicle so that, you know, after I'm yeah. old and sick, they can take my pension away and that's it, you know, and there's got to be more. And there's gotta uh, be more. I think like, psychedelics stimulate that. They at least stimulate you to wonder about it and, and, and think there's got to be a better way. And uh so yeah, they're dangerous, all right. They're not dangerous to the people that take them. They're dangerous to the people that don't take them. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, it's, I mean, the work, it's, it, it's before I even came to the, um, came to psychedelics, I, I had that feeling that suddenly the idea of structure and religion and everything just slowly but surely, it was, I saw through it all, we'll say. It's not that I, mm -hmm. I Maybe it was a bit of education, a bit of reading, but I saw through absolutely everything. You could say that's a bit of a, but any kind of the idea of a guru or somebody you know who is, who who knows something and they and going to make you get to this place like that guru mentality. I don't even like that. Like I don't like, um, uh, but for me anyway, the big thing about the psychedelic, I suppose, one the where I, uh, is the idea that um, if you're stuck. So there's the explore exploration side when maybe right. you're at you're at right. peace and you can explore, um, mm -hmm. but then there is the the um, therapeutic. Uh, like you run retreats now, uh, we've we've skipped yeah, yeah. a good few years, but you run retreats now, and obviously people come to those with multiplicity of things they want to resolve, and there's mm -hmm. wondrous things happen. Is that? It's true. It's true. I mean, we, uh, yeah, we do these retreats and, uh, uh, you know, and sometimes wondrous things happen. People go with all sorts of agendas hmm. and sometimes it's something specific about something they're, you know, they have depression or they have some, some issue like that that they want to address. Other people are just curious and that's fine. Um, we go out of our way to say to not impose our expectations on it. We we tell our people the medicine is the teacher. Yeah, we're here to facilitate your personal experience with this medicine, and a lot of times our job is to stay out of the way. You know, mm -hmm. to let that happen. But if you get into some trouble or things get difficult, then you know we have a few tricks we can help bring you back to, you know, your center. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm anti-guru. I'm not, I mean, call it what you want, anti-priest, guru, spiritual leader, even Kieran Darrow. Yeah. You know, uh, anybody who tells you they have the answers and that you That's, should accept. And, and, here's ten all, and here's 10 steps. And here's 10 steps. It's Forget always, it. it's always 10. Uh, out of it. I'm gone. I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's always 10. Yeah. I'm out of it. You know, <laughs> it's funny, I don't, I, yeah, I uh, I, and I kind of reached that point whenever it was X number of years because I, in that spiritual game, we'd say it's another game, it's another 
you know, seeking it's another for, game. seeking for what it's, our it's giving spiritual. To, it, it's it's trying to convince somebody to accept a bunch of dog or or adopt a kind of behavior that is convenient for them, not necessarily for you, not yeah. necessarily fulfilling. You know, it's That's, just their bludgeons to keep people in line and screw that. That's what psychedelics are the antidote it's, to, it's, it's all know? about the kind of the validating me almost you know when somebody say somebody sits on the side of a cliff and they're meditating and they see that there's only oneness and oh, you know whatever and right. they see that and then they go okay geez i meditated there and i made that happen i'm going to teach everybody how to meditate like that to get back there right and, and there's another religion but look i need a bit of funding so let let's make it a voluntary donation. Let's just say, right, you, know, right. you know, you know that one. That's the best one. You know, whatever you think, you know, <laughs> a couple of hundred. Yeah, no. Other people give that. I, yeah, I I know it very well, and you know, certainly psychedelics are not immune to that. I mean, there are yeah. any number of people who, you know, they see the psychedelics as a. It, vehicle to their power their their self-aggrandizement or whatever uh and you know and so they can set themselves up as a teacher uh, or a shaman or however they, they want to present themselves but almost i, own, I do almost that. own the psychedelic nearly almost this is you know my psychedelic that i'm bringing to you but the way you said it is lovely we get out of the way they, they we get out of the way yeah. and and about the only message that i have to teach people is i long ago forgot everything i know <laughs> you know yeah. I, mean, I mean this this is what ayahuasca always tells me in a sense sometimes gently and sometimes not it says you know remember how little you know yeah. you know and uh what is this i cannot take this sorry um you know, that's often, I mean, after all these years of taking um, ayahuasca and other things, what I learn is really the limitations of what we know. Yeah. Which in some ways is there's no, I mean, that does not depress me. It actually makes me kind of happy, you know, because that means there's a lot to learn. And if you're curious, then, you know, the whole world is open to you. Uh, but um, it, yeah, it's funny because I have I have spent all, all these years maybe uh, it's been looking and reading and listening and uh, and um, the conclusion that I come to is that whatever this is, whatever this is, say this now even us talking, right? Um, really at the finite of the nowness of whatever existence, right? The the cliff edge of the abyss. <laughs> I've been using that right. word abyss since um, I think starting your book, but the abyss abyss says an awful lot. You know, abyss is abyss is really mm -hmm. it's it's the vacuum, the the the, the vast nothing well, we're, we're that underlies always, everything. Yeah, I think we're always perched on the edge of the abyss yeah. in a certain sense. I mean, we look back, see the path we've traveled, the past, how we got there, but the abyss is an unknown essentially the being on the edge of the abyss is to be on the interface between the past which you more or less know but the future you don't really know you know i mean anything could happen you have suppositions about what's going to happen in the future you know in the next five minutes in the next day in the next 50 years you have all of all kinds of suppositions some of them quite reasonable but you know but the you, future you, you don't even know what those right. you don't even know what those suppositions are you don't even know what the suppositions are until they appear so you don't even know that no one. yeah or you can you can say you know you can say i pretty much know what i'm gonna do when this you know when this interviews ends or whatever you can you can project into the future reasonable suppositions yeah. You know, but I may get up from the computer here and have a stroke and fall down the stairs, and it's curtains, man. Yeah, it's all over. <laughs> there's no way to 
there's no way to predict that's not going to happen. Yeah, it's the un, it's so, unknow, it's unknowable. But even yeah, this, we're oh. always on the abyss of this of this uncertainty. You know, the future is. You know, the the interface we're at. This is the quantum wave collapsing uh, mm. into uh, what Alfred North Whitehead called the formality of actually occurring. You know, I, I don't know if you know Whitehead's work at all. No, I don't. Um, Alfred North Whitehead, it's great stuff because he's, uh, I mean, Terrence and I kind of cut our teeth on that way back when we were puzzling all this stuff out. He has a great, he's, he's a metaphysician. Basically, he's a metaphysician, but he's also a mathematician. So he's like, not a mystic at all, but in some ways, um, you know, a, a science grounded mystic you could say mm -hmm. that you know i mean his his uh his philosophy is very interesting and and you know and was sort of crafted in the age when quantum mechanics was was current and he and bertrand russell wrote a major uh book together on mathematics which was called principia mathematica mm -hmm. um which I never read. I mean, I'm not saying I read. I read other things that he yeah. wrote. But that one was way beyond me. But anyway, why am I blathering about that? Oh, because essentially he had a, a metaphysical uh, worldview that was compatible with Western science. So that was appealing to us. You know, the Eastern view, worldviews are very similar, but they're not really grounded in science. So, mm. uh, you know, Whitehead's ideas were, but he, he a lot of his uh, philosophy. I now I remember um, a lot of his philosophy was in discussing how do things happen. You mm. know, I mean his his major tome, and it is a tome. It's heavy sledding, but it's it's called process and reality, and it is devoted to a very in depth discussion of. How do things happen? How do things happen to manifest, you know, in the world of our experience? And of course, we were very interested in that because of La Chirera and because of the time wave, you know, yeah. which is really a whole other conversation at some yeah. point. But yeah. the time wave was supposedly an instrument which was given to us by the mushrooms, you know, the basic blueprint was downloaded to Terence, not to me at La Chirera. And then over years, he developed this time wave, this very elaborate idea about time. But yeah. the nugget of it came from the mushroom teacher at La Chirera. Mm. And the time wave was supposed to be all about predicting novelty. And, and, and uh, Whitehead talked about all of this. Novelty being a big event, the most, yeah, or or the idea that there really are new things under the sun. You know, they say there's no, nothing new under the sun. That's mm -hmm. not true. There are things occurring all the time that have never ever occurred in the history of the universe, and those things are those are novel. Those are novel events. Can we find a way to predict their eruption into history? That's what the time wave was all about. Yeah. I, I mean, it, complete, it completely failed, you know. I mean, it was a good idea, but it didn't work, you know, uh, for various reasons. I mean, and it, it, yeah, I mean, we could go into that as it's probably another podcast. But, well, it probably uh, is, but it, I hit you with various, it. various reasons it did not work, but it was, but in, in principle, the idea was, was, was good. It's just that it, the time wave turned out not to be an instrument for predicting the future or measuring novelty, but the I, the concept was sound. Yeah, the implementation not so much. You know, well, it was it was an extraordinary way to be thinking at the ripe age that you were. To be honest, I, you know, but but that that time thing. Can I hit you with the idea of timelessness? Um, that there is no time. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. So, it's, it's, so I, I sat in a room with somebody and we chatted and 
that you just said to me, well, there is no time. There's only this, and it's, br it's yeah. constantly brand new. It's exploding out of nothing. And this, That's this, right. this is infinity. That's right. This is the Big Bang. And the only thing that's, there's a story going on, which is a personal story that goes from A to B, but it's a story that the universe enjoys or oneness or whatever, that it appears, but it appears and disappears. And that's it, but there, I, there's only I this. Think, yeah. What do you think of this? that? There's only this. Well, I, I, think, I think that's exactly right. I think that uh, uh, time as we perceive it, time is, is something that biology brings to it. You know, in other words, we are immersed in the moment of perception for, there's really only the present, right? Yeah. There's only what you are experiencing. Yeah. That's the present. The future hasn't happened yet. The past is gone. But in our brains and in our brains and bodies, we have to artificially synthesize a past in the form of memory and anticipation of what is going to happen in the form of whatever it is, I suppose, supposition. We have to do that because otherwise you know, things wouldn't make sense. I mean, time is a convenience. It's a, it's yes. an invention of biology. It's an invention. Of the it's fact an that we, we are, yeah, it's an invention. Yeah. Because we are processes, you know, we, we're not objects, we're processes. You know, yeah. I mean, you're sitting here and you look fairly solid, you know, and you are fairly solid, but you're basically a process you're metabolizing right which means yeah. that biologically you're changing every minute yeah. when that stops you're not interesting anymore yeah because you're dead <laughs> right i mean an organism that's not metabolizing is by definition not living so <laughs> you know I, I, I sat in a room with some i know somebody else in my journeys and they said well you're dead already the only illusion is that you are and it's just an illusion that dies in, you see, you die in deep sleep and you reappear and the self, and it comes down to this idea of the self. I didn't think we'd going to get into this, but this idea of the self is what is time related. So me, yeah. I am yeah. this, this, this there, fixed yeah. me who's experiencing yeah. the world, but that's the illusion. And really mm -hmm. everything else comes from that. Yeah, now we're getting into some pretty, uh, pretty heavy. Well, we are. So do, you know, so, so, do you know what I'm going to do? Though I'm going to bring it, I'm going to bring it back to the psychedelic in a kind of a link to, and why I, I started my big interest in it. Maybe was, um, and this. Is, so basically, you know, there was the brain scans done in the recent research about showing a brain before LSD and then on LSD, and. Um, mm -hmm. And the brain on LSD, apparently it was Robin Carhart Harris said that it's not dissimilar to that of a child. Okay. Yep. That when, it's yep. lit, when it's lit up like that. So bear with the idea that I, I kind of, I liked the idea in my mind. Then I was thinking of, um, you know, Jesus again said something about, it's not until you see through the eyes of a child that you'll see the kingdom of heaven. And I kind of, in my mind, I liked the way the mystical was linked through the science. I know it's a bit loose, the, the Lincoln, but the mystical linked through science and the psychedelic somehow brings back, we'll say that, or brings in that, it brings a lot of fucking things. It's not all roses, right. but it, it brings no, that, that childlike, childlike, childlike wonder, we'll say. Right. No, I think that's very apt. I think that's exactly, in a way, that's what it does. I would say that, uh, you know, the, the world of a child is, especially if they're pre-literate, I think, you know, when you get to literacy, that changes things, you know, and we all want to be literate, right? Because mm. there are advantages to being literate, but that absolutely changes the way a person sees and interacts with the world. Yeah. But if a child in a pre-literate stage before they've started thinking yeah. uh, is just open and we, and I would say uh, an indigenous person also is 
has a way of perceiving the world much more close to a child's than it is to somebody like us who has you know all these this cultural history and personal history of of yeah, uh, me of liter literacy and, yeah and the psychedelics temporarily demolish that in us yeah. they cause these, these neural gating mechanisms in science it's called neural gating and gating is basically a lot of what the brain does is it filters things out mm. it it lets only certain things through because if it let everything through it would be like you'd be in a blooming buzzing confusion all the time you know mm. and which is sort of what a psychedelic state is but you know so the brain among many other things it does with this information that's coming from outside but a lot of what it does is it, it blocks stuff it's a and veil, yeah, filter psychedelics, it's there but you can temporarily remove those gates mm. or lower lower the threshold and then that's a big part of the of being in the psychedelic state you've temporarily disabled those gates you know, which is one reason why you want to pay a lot of attention to set and setting when you do a psychedelic, because you want to be in a situation where, okay, you can, you can disable those things, mm. which are kind of basic functions ensuring your survival, right? Yeah. I mean, you've got to be focused on the saber-toothed tiger that's yeah. coming to eat you or the semi on the freeway that's about to smack you. You know, you, you want to pretty much have that be the center of your attention mm. and not all these distractions but yeah. at some point paying attention to the things that we normally filter out and you realize that the interesting thing is you you can take a psychedelic and see this and, and see yeah there are lots of things going on that are normally in the background you know mm. that suddenly are in the foreground but then when you're not stoned that perception is also valid you know mm. you can learn a new way to see things and you can like the next day or whatever you can go to the same place and say i noticed this and that and all these other mm. things i never noticed before mm. but hey they're still here and i'm not stoned and now i'm seeing them because i learned how to yeah. how to perceive them so i think that's what psychedelics are largely they are tools um you know, for uh, I, I don't know, their lenses, probably the best analogy is their lenses for looking at the world in a way that you've never looked at it before. Yeah. You know, because we tend to see through filters and we tend to see just very narrowly what is going on yeah. and disregard all the rest. And uh, mm. so they're very useful that way. But it, 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 for me, um, when I took ayahuasca, and ayahuasca is the I had never done anything, and then I took ayahuasca at the age of forty. Um, it was the first thing I was introduced to two cupfuls, and um, it was um, it, the purging part lasted most of it. Let's just say, yeah. Um, but I had six. But everything that was kind of came to me was all just really ordinary things about uh life and my life do you know what i mean it was really yeah. things that needed to be taken care of it's uh like this idea of um uh um uh what was i going to say to you i got distracted there by something that appeared did you send me something there I sent you the link to the retreats I do. Yeah, very good. Okay, I'll use that in the talk or in the when I'm yeah. when I'm posting the video, um, I would put that in. I was actually half curious. I've only ever done it once, and I was looking at it going, how can I convince my wife to, that I can get away for a few weeks? <laughs> <laughs> Let her look after the kids. You never know. You, uh, you never know. You never know. Well, you, the way you get around that is you both come. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you give the kids to grandma and grandpa or something. Or... Yeah, that'd be lovely. That'd be amazing. Um, <laughs> how are you for time? Are you okay for another few minutes? Or how is it looking? Uh, we can go another few minutes. I've got a call coming up in a little bit, but we okay. can. 
I'm All sorry right. it's so short. Uh, no, obviously. Uh, you see, that's the thing I knew. I, I wish I'd been more structured with you. But anyway, um, hopefully I'll get you again sometime. We can, we can go back. We can do it again. No yeah. worries. Um, I was going to say one thing I noticed in the book. There's a new Dan Brown book. This is just a total aside. But there's a new Dan Brown book. I don't know if you know Dan Brown. He's a guy who... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Da Vinci but, Code. Da Vinci Code, that. not. But in his new book... He talks about, there's a part of it, I'm giving away a bit of the book, but this evolution of humans into kind of humans and machines. But I just, you talked about in that in the part of your book, just thought it was interesting. I hadn't heard that kind of theory before. And then I, I saw it in his book, but it was in your book that we'll evolve into this. Anyway, that's, a, that's just something I've written down here. The one I've got here, but I think it's a, it's a whole, it's totally different. It's a whole new podcast, but... Today, I read the line, um, you monkeys only think you're running the show. Yep. From your That's book. That's my mantra. That's my and mantra, I, yeah. And I because <laughs> that particular thought, right, and we, I, we won't have time probably, but that particular thought in my mind had been going on, because I listened to, I, I, you were obviously on Joe Rogan. That's where I found about you. I didn't really come, I didn't know much about Terrence, so I would have stumbled upon Terence, but I listened to Paul Stammons talking about the mushroom, and mm -hmm. I, and then I went and looked at something else, and it was just so apparent, like you know, this whole idea of saving the planet and we're destroying everything, and then you kind of look and kind of go, ah, what what's what's in control really when you consider the power of plant life. And then mm -hmm. today, you know, I was trying to figure that out, but then that line came up that you had in your experience, you monkeys only think you're running the show and you, you had such relief almost. Yeah, we only think our run, we're running the show and, uh, and it is a, it's a dangerous delusion. Mm. You know, it's dangerous because it also, well, you need to keep in mind who's running the show, right? Yeah. And and at, at base on the planet, who's running the show is the plants, mm. you know, because they are through these, you know, planetary-wide phenomena of photosynthesis, and it is maintaining the balance of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the atmosphere. It's producing oxygen, which is convenient for us, because we happen to need it to breathe, you know, mm. and it also is sequestering carbon dioxide into plant biomass. And so it, it really, you're probably familiar with James Lovelock's uh, idea about the Gaia hypothesis. No. Um, oh, well, you gotta, you gotta read that. You gotta read the, uh, he's actually a geophysicist and, uh, you know, the guy hypothesis is very simple uh, idea. And a lot of people have said it's like new age poppycock, but it's actually not. Uh, and, and the simplest, in the simplest expression of it, it is that the reason the planet, planet is compatible for life and has been for 3.8 billion years, they figure you know, bacteria probably showed up, the oldest bacteria probably showed up in the ecosystem about 3.8 billion years ago. So life's been around a long time. Mm. And the basic tenet of the Gaia hypothesis is that this is not accidental, that the reason the, the within very broad limits, the reason the environmental parameters like the surface temperature of the earth, composition of the atmosphere and so on, have been maintained in these fairly narrow limits for so long is that life actually intervenes to make sure that happens, you know, and it's not a, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's not something that invokes consciousness or anything like that. I mean, there may be consciousness involved, but it, it, it's more like the complex system, an ecosystem, a planetary system or whatever, are regulated through these feedback loops. Complex systems like to cleave to stability. They like to cleave to equilibrium, mm. you know? And so the, the entire living community of organisms, which you call the biosphere, 
actively participates in making sure, for instance, that the Earth's temperature never goes above the boiling point of water, never mm -hmm. falls below the freezing point of water. You know, the acidity of the oceans, the pH of the oceans is, is very highly buffered. Um, the composition of the atmosphere is, you know, highly regulated. There's never too much oxygen, too much carbon dioxide, and so on. Life is doing that. There are plenty of uh, examples where you can look at other planets where similar things were going on, and somehow these homeostatic regulatory uh, mechanisms got destabilized. And it all went off track, you know, and it, Mars that, is such a planet. That sounds to me like it's a, um, life, there's an, almost a hair's breadth between life and not life. The way you're describing it, it seems almost so many things have to come together. Well, we are very busily trying to dismantle these. We're not trying to, but we're doing it because we're thoughtlessly, you know, overusing these resources. We're dumping tons of carbon dioxide, you know, we've raised the, the uh, number of parts per million of carbon dioxide, mm. about 200 parts per million since the start of the 19th century. And we can see the effects of human activity on these very delicate, I mean, delicate, not that delicate, but mm. delicate enough that we can disturb them. Mm. And, they, and we can't think of you know, we don't plan very well, you know, mm. as species. So we plan on and this whole idea that, uh, you know, we have to grow everything. We have to grow the economy. The population is growing. We're putting incredible stress on, on the resources. And yet we have a hard time getting our heads around the fact that we, you know, we don't need to be trying to grow the economy necessarily. We need to stabilize the economy and we need to, you know, consume less and well, all those things that, you know, we're not doing very well. And, and the problem partly is that as societies and as people, you know, we can't look very far ahead. Is that just you know? the insatiable self really, isn't it? The unsatisfable yeah. Yeah. need of yeah, the... I think of the person to just we take. want it all and we want it now and we don't want anybody to tell us that we can't have it and this is a this is a problem and it, it's yeah. funny in the first when i took um lsd the first time i was actually this <laughs> i was almost this being we'd say it's the it was an ego and I was walking around an old fireplace i had become this i don't want to bore you with my but what I was saying out loud was, what's in it for me? And it's uh -huh. like every inter human interaction almost is an agenda of, you know, what's in it for me? What's me, in it for me? me. And sure. this thing, this, it can't be satisfied, this thing. Anyway, but it was interesting the way the well, psychedelic would reveal something like that so crystal clear. Yeah, it, it part it partly is a is a, is the antidote is a cure for that because it, for one thing it makes you you know it puts front and center that there is no me I mean we're all one right mm. so what's in it for you is what's in it for everybody yeah. we we can't be totally focused on the self because we need this network of relationships in order to survive you know mm. if there was only you you wouldn't last very long. So I think mm -hmm. psychedelics, again, one of the lessons that they teach is that, you know, what's in it for you has to be what's in it for everybody. And if we can, you know, it, it helps you, I think, understand that, you know, relationships in some way are more important than, than individuals or the individual. It's your relationship to your loved ones, your community, your your environment, all of these things. I think Eastern people have a a better perspective on this. You know, like like Japanese uh, culture is all about relationships. You know, I, I, I felt when I was reading in, just on the book, I felt reading that you all the relationships that you had 
And to me, it seems like the psychedelic almost, there was an awful lot of peace with any relationship you talked about. There was, there was any anger towards, would say, an ex or anything like that. It all kind of, time after time, you could spot the resolution in your mind almost. You know, when you were describing the scenario, you'd always, there's the, the seeing from the other side and it was kind of let go. And that has to be the psychedelic. I, 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 is it? Yeah, I suppose so. I think, yeah, yeah maybe I think so. I mean, I mean, I have had, you know, poor relationships with people and and fights and anger and so on. I mean, like we all do. But in the yeah. end, I I don't, I don't tend to carry grudges against people because what's the point, mm. you know? And you've got to sort of, you know, if you can put yourself in their shoes and say, why, you know, why is this person so angry, uh, so angry at me? Mm. I can have some compassion for that. And mm. I think, I think that's one thing psychedelics help you do is see ourselves as others see us and mm -hmm. uh, see other people as maybe, you know, it, it takes away that layer of judgment. You know, it's so mm -hmm. easy to judge people and judgment usually involves a set of assumptions, probably wrong ones mm -hmm. about, you know, their existential situation. I mean, you know, why are they such a bastard or why are they so this or that? Well, there's reasons behind that. They were not born that way, mm -hmm. you know, but everybody takes the material of life and, uh, and makes of it what they will. But, but yeah, I'm, I don't, I don't carry, carry grudges against people at least not very long, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, because there, it takes too much energy to nurture those things. And it's better to just let it go. Yeah. You know, I mean, mm. I, I'm too busy to waste time on that, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that sounds really, uh, that doesn't sound the way I want it to sound. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Very good. I'm kind of, I mean, I, I have, I have lots of character flaws. Don't think I don't, you know. Yeah, so I'm not, I, I, yeah, not standing yeah. myself no, I, up as a like guru. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah. Not, I, I wouldn't. Not at all. I wouldn't put that much pressure on you. Don't worry. No, it was just that it I was mean, an, an overriding kind of sense and a couple of things. I just thought, only from my own experience, I thought, well, now that's again, that's the unsaid benefit. Although you actually did point to it on one case with one lost love we'll say yeah it's terrible i know so much about you it's <laughs> from the book it's not really fair <laughs> uh, well anybody that reads the books they will know these things and i figured well you know my experience is kind of the common human experience you know yeah, in a way and i mean is, yeah. well, at the end of the day we're all just curious monkeys trying mm, to try to get by yeah Trying to get by, trying, trying to, to understand by. and trying to, you know, not completely, uh, you know, get through life without hurting people or the environment or whatever too much. I mean, that's about all we can hope for. So, yeah. mm. well, yeah. it's been a pleasure talking to you. I can see this is uh, only the first of many probably, but yeah. That would be amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I, I seriously mean it's so nice of you to take a leap like that. And um, I, I, yeah. Well, you, nice. you struck me as an interesting person and I was right, you are. So, and you're, hey, you're an Irishman. So right there we have- <laughs> We that, didn't even that, go there, yeah. <laughs> we didn't even go there. We that's that's the- there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, I really mean that. Hi, if you like the conversation that I just had and you'd like more, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you. Frank, Frank, Frank. 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 Fr